I went from data analyst, senior data analyst, junior data scientist, data scientist. And my final compensation when I left Navy Federal, and this is me as a 27 year old, which is a grotesque amount of money to be making, to be honest, was $213,000. I noticed that you worked at Navy Federal Credit Union as a data scientist. And then even prior to that, you were a, a student at Yale. And so some people are interested about becoming data scientists. They kind of want to know what's the pathway? How do I get into this career field? I know it's not required that you go to Yale. Some people may hear that and maybe think, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to do it. So what would you kind of say is, are like some of the different pathways to becoming a data scientist for those who are interested in that career field? Yeah, for sure. And just like for everyone's context, actually, when, when, I, when I was at Yale, my major was in chemical engineering, which has like a little bit of overlap with data science, but, but not a huge amount. And as I worked at Navy Federal, I had the good fortune of mentoring a lot of folks who had non-technical jobs, whether they were executive assistants or back office operational workers and so on. And I helped them transition anywhere from seven to 12 months of like training to becoming data analysts and eventually doing more and more data science roles. And so just to break it down real quickly, first off, the difference between data analysts and a data scientist is roughly that a data analyst kind of paints a story, paints a picture with numbers to provide, you know, business insights of what types of business decisions should we make. And a data scientist does all of that, plus like a lot of predictive analytics. And so this is anything from, you know, linear regression, which is a fancy term for drawing a line between points uh, all the way up through like AI and machine learning and all of that stuff. And the path that I helped my friends and colleagues get on was, well, let's first become a data analyst. And really the like trifecta of what you need to know there is SQL, which is a uh, stands for structured query language or SQL. And that is a language that allows you to query databases and get data out. And then you can use tools even like Excel to then paint a picture with those numbers to take averages, group the numbers together, what have you. And you can use Python and R as well to do said data manipulations to find like insights and so on. And then once you have your, once you have your knowledge there and your insights and what, and what the story is you're trying to tell, then you go to PowerPoint, which is the third tool to you know, tell your story, give an executive summary, make graphs and so on that illustrate the takeaways that you have. And that gets you started as a data analyst. And then over time, you can learn all of the different like algorithms for the foundations of machine learning. And I'll say some phrases here, but yeah, anything from linear regression, logistic regression, k-means clustering, so on. Um, which all sound like really fancy terms. So once you get under the hood, they're, you know, relatively simple to understand. And then you can start predicting things, you know, what's the likelihood of it raining tomorrow or, and that, and, you know, anything upwards to that and that are relevant for bit for the business cases that you're working on. And once you have a good grasp of all of, all of that math and the implementations of, of those things, whether it's in Python or R or whatever other programming language, then you're, you're, you're set to be a junior data scientist. Hey man, that's a beautiful explanation. I mean, the way you laid it out is really so simple. Like you need SQL to query the database, Python or R to analyze the data and then PowerPoint to tell the story of like, what is the data doing or what did it tell you to do? So I think that's amazing insight. And your role at Navy Fredo Credit Union, like what were you guys using the data for? Was it to, I don't know, predict like financial gains or like insurance claims or what in, in exactly? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So when I was at Navy Federal, uh, I tend to move teams quite frequently, actually. And so I worked on their membership analytics team. And so we were predicting how much is the membership great base going to grow by in a given month or quarter or year? What are those folks going to look like? And so, you know, as a military serving institution, we were trying to see, are we going to get more folks from the Navy or the Army or any of the other branches? Um, or their family members or housemates of uh, like family or friends. Oh yeah, family of family and that sort of thing. Where was, yeah, where's the majority of our growth coming from all the way through to doing like enterprise wide, like AI and machine learning on behalf of different departments like lending and so on. Like, and these are things that were particularly relevant during the pandemic, but you know, who might be at most need for like an emergency line of credit. Uh, if something like a pandemic were to happen, people lose their jobs, um, so on. Uh, who's most likely to see an income decrease or an income increase uh, over coming t periods of time? Because then we can tailor our product recommendations to them and get them what they need at the right time. 
and, and yeah, and all sorts of questions. And those models impacted, you know, millions of people that uh, were in our membership base. You kind of hit on like in your role at Navy Federal that you did a lot of mentoring and helping other folks kind of transition into those data analyst roles. Were they kind of learning on their own through like Coursera or Udemy or were they kind of finding time to kind of work on the job and pick up extra projects there? How were they kind of being able to learn that knowledge and then transition into those more technical roles? So I, over time, I actually had developed sort of like a curriculum of like, okay, here's like the easiest, yeah, like on Coursera or on Udemy, like the first like introduction to SQL or Python or the concepts in data science and so on. But the biggest gains were really made kind of like in the lab at work where I was like, look, we're gonna stay late together after work. I'm gonna give you access to my computer and we're going to query data together. And that way you can, you know, more, you know, in a tactile sense, work with the data that you would actually be working with at this company. And so then we were able to, you know, I was able to give them access to these tables. They were able to query data, see like the types of insights that you can make super simply where it's like, you know, what's a good example, you know, by age buckets, what's the average deposits of all members at Navy Federal? And you can see that as you go from like 18 to 24, 25 through 34, so on and so forth, that deposits tended to increase and you know, and as such, who are the people who might need the most help, you know, getting financial momentum and so on and so forth. And in some cases, we we're even able to start building a portfolio of insights where I would go to certain teams across the um, across the credit union because I, I was, you know, increasingly working enterprise wide and knew most of the m most of the analytics teams. And I'm like, look, you guys probably don't have enough uh, analysts on hand. Give me like a back burner project, something you've always been interested in. But you just haven't had the time to do and your team hasn't had the time to do and they'd be like, oh, we've been wanting to look into X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, okay, great. And I would take that back to um, the folks that I was training and I would be like, right, yeah, we're going to figure out how to investigate this question um, and answer it. And then they would present those findings to the manager of the team or to the assistant vice president and so on. And those types of things take you really, really far and that motivation. And that's how they were able to make the transition from like totally non-technical, no coding, no SQL, no data analytics or anything like that to having like a data analyst job um, and getting the promotions thereafter uh, in, you know, anywhere from like seven to 12 months was just stunningly fast. Like, and all the only thing that I cared about when I was taking people on was like, were you willing to work hard? Like I didn't pay attention to pedigree. Uh, I helped folks anywhere from, you know, young in their 20s, they had more free time to becoming data, data analyst to, you know, a single mother in her 40s, didn't go to college and, and she's thriving as a data analyst now herself at Navy Federal and, you know, folks of all walks of life, you know, and anyone can do it for sure. You know, as long as you just have access to quality resources, the motivation to work hard and train and hopefully a mentor who can help guide you along the way, you're, you're good to go. Last question I want to hit on on the data science part. Of course, people are always interested and motivated motivated by money or income that are associated with some of these tech roles or data science roles. Are you able to share like how much a data analyst or a data scientist may typically make? And this could be like your own personal experience or just kind of industry yeah. knowledge that you're aware of. Yeah, for sure. And so take all of this with a little grain of salt because some of it, you know, is pursuant to, you know, if you tried to, if you're trying to get a master's degree or are getting a master's degree, for example, I was working on and am one semester away from finishing a master's degree in analytics from Georgia Tech. I dropped out in order to start working on walkthrough um, because it's very important to be a dropout of something in order to be a startup founder, as everyone knows. But <laughs> But yeah, the, 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 rough lint, the, the rough trajectory of it for me was so when I first started working at Navy Federal, I came in at kind of like a mid-level data analyst, which I uh, was a little more qualified for and uh, for that position. So my baseline salary was 90 grand and my bonuses at the end, the end of the year were roughly like 28 to 32 percent of that. And then as everyone should think about in terms of like their total compensation, you should also take in all the, you know, health insurance, 401k match, and all of those different things. And so all of those benefits were also roughly like twenty to $30,000. Um, and then as I went through my final job as a mid-level data scientist, so at that point I had like three, four promotions to that point because I went from data analyst, senior data analyst, junior data scientist, data scientist. 
Um, and my final compensation when I left Navy Federal, and this was me as a 27 year old, which is a grotesque amount of money to be making, to be honest, was $213,000. And so the breakdown of that was 135K in salary, about 55K in bonus. And then what does that leave me with? Quick maths. Yeah, like 25 or I guess, yeah, 23,000 in, in other benefits. And yeah. When you're making that sort of money, when you grow up uh, relatively broke, it's like, you know, my, my, my younger sister works, my mom works, my dad works um, all back in, the, in, in New Orleans. And like, I made more than all three of them put together. Like, that's just obscene, man. It's crazy. And so, uh, yeah, if you're able to work hard and, and to get one of these jobs, you're, you're, you're probably sitting pretty for a good bit. And uh, that's definitely life changing. And I think even when you put it in that perspective of like your salary compared to your family's combined salary, like that's life changing. That's generational changing. So I think it's, sure. it's amazing. And then real quick, that role that you were in at Navy Federal, because I know sometimes salaries depend on like location. Where were you working at at the time? Was it in Philadelphia, Atlanta, New Orleans? Where where? At? Yeah, great question. So Navy Federal's main headquarters is based in the Northern Virginia, like Washington D.C. area. So relatively high cost of living. And so, yeah, I was based in Northern Virginia in a, in a town called Vienna. Yeah. But one of the an important context there is that while I was still working there, I moved to Philadelphia because my wife started working on the administrative side for the Philadelphia Orchestra. And Philadelphia has a notable lower cost of living than like than D.C., than Northern Virginia, so on. Like the county that I used to live in, um, like Fairfax, county in northern virginia and it's adjacent to another one loudon county like they're like the wealthiest uh counties like on average in the country or something like that and so yeah the cost of living was definitely pretty different but they did not adjust my salary downward and so and that is largely a function of just like how they do geographical zones and kind of lump all of the mid-atlantic together basically and so that was a huge benefit to me while I was still working there for sure. But, you know, even if you're in a middle or lower cost area, especially if you can get if you can get a remote job that indexes to like San Francisco or New York, that's actually a huge arbitrage. And that's a fancy term for like, you know, you can kind of save the differences uh, where a huge arbitrage opportunity where, you know, if you get one of those jobs and you go and live in like Omaha or Tulsa or somewhere in the Midwest, dude, you're going to be saving so much money. Like it's, it's, it's absolutely insane. I don't know why more people don't, don't do it. Um, especially if you're single or, and you're not like tied down to any place, like send it, go live somewhere cheap, save all the money you can. And you might be financially independent in like 10 years. Like you, like, and then you, you can do whatever you want thereafter. Yeah. No, that's a great point that I think a lot of people don't actually pay attention to. Um, and I know we were talking about like nomadic lifestyle and it's become more popular since the pandemic, but like, yo, Mexico city, Philippines, like it doesn't even have to just be tied to like the U S like if you can find a cheaper cost of living and, and maximize your income, uh, you can be living like a king. 